This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. Tonight on Unsolved Mysteries, this peaceful suburban neighborhood in New Jersey concealed a violent and secretive Colombian cocaine gang. The vicious ringleader of this gang vanished in 1986. The FBI wants your help in tracking him down. The sweetheart swindler is a charming but ruthless con man who preys on unsuspecting women by stealing their hearts and then their money. In an 11 hour period in March of 1988, a sadistic spree of violence left four people dead in two different states. And shockingly, the suspects are two teenage boys. Also, we will present a most unusual and poignant case of kidnapping. In 1944, two teenage girls told 10 week old Lawrence Harding Jr. from in front of his mother's Chicago apartment. For over 45 years, his brother Jeffrey has been trying to solve this case. He is convinced that Lawrence is still alive may even be watching tonight. Join me. You may be able to help solve a mystery. Imagine watching television and suddenly learning you've been kidnapped as an infant and had a brother and two parents that you never thought existed. Well, somewhere in the United States, there is a man who in the next few minutes may make this shocking discovery. It all began 37 years ago, 1953, when an eight-year-old boy named Jeffrey Harding was taught it by schoolmates about a brother he never knew. That same day, Jeffrey's mother showed him some scrapbooks stored in the attic. She explained that he did indeed have a brother, but the boy was kidnapped before Jeffrey had been born. What was he like? Well, baby, Mama really didn't know what he was like. See, I didn't get to spend a lot of time with him, like I spent with you. I just didn't know what to do. I felt so empty inside, and I felt so, so sad for my parents. I could just look in my mother's eyes and see the pain. These two girls came, and they took him. And they ran. Will I ever see him again? No. And I, I also wanted to know what it was like to have a brother. And I always felt cheated that I couldn't communicate with him. I couldn't play with him. I couldn't wrestle with him. Couldn't go to a ball game with him. I couldn't do anything like everybody else did with their own brother and sister. This is the article. FBI reported in search for kidnapped baby. The Federal Bureau of Investigation Yesterday, Jeffrey's mother brought out a baby book and read him clippings she had saved about the events of June 30th, 1944. The baby was kidnapped eight days ago by two Negro girls. Spencer Dayton of the Chicago FBI Department declined comment. According to federal law, however, a kidnapped victim was presumed. That morning, the 10 week old Lawrence Jr. in his carriage, Jeffrey's mother made her customary trip to the corner market. And while she was in the store, there were two girls there, that, teenage girls that didn't look like they were up to anything bad. Oh, what a doll. <laughs> you really have a cute baby. Oh, thank you. It's my first. Margaret didn't recognize the two girls from the neighborhood, but felt go. that their attention was innocent. As my mother was coming home from the market, the two girls were following her. But she didn't think a whole lot of it. She just thought that the two girls were walking down the street as she was going home. And when she pulled into the yard with the baby carriage, she saw a neighbor uh, who lived upstairs. Can you mind little Lawrence for me? Sure, I will. I'm just going to run these inside. OK. The lady who was supposed to be watching my brother didn't um, keep an eye on him long enough. 
Uh, she watched him for a little while and then she kind of turned away. By the time my mother, who was running as fast as she could, got to the alley and could, could run after the girls, could give chase to the girls, the girls were gone. Lawrence! 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 Oh, After three agonizing days, the Who Hardings received a phone call. We have your baby. You have the baby? And the girl on the other end of the line identified herself as one of the people that took the baby. And the girl said, we're going to bring the baby to you. And my mother said, when? Will you please bring him home? And as she was waiting for an answer, the girl hung up on her. When? She was never asked for a ransom. And that was the last contact my mother had with the kidnappers. The FBI and the Chicago police searched for Lawrence Jr. to no avail. Finally, after four weeks, the investigation was called off. Lawrence Harding Jr. had vanished into thin air. 45 years ago, because the authorities couldn't help my parents, and because everyone was advising them that they should try to adjust to the fact that they would never see their son again, for the last 45 years, they've had to do just that. They've had to try to live in a life, a full life, knowing that they would never see their son again. When my mother told me what had happened, and I think it was then that a seed was kind of planted inside of me that because I love my parents, I wanted to make this right for them. Jeffrey searched for his missing brother ran into one stone wall after another until August of 1986. Thanks to the Freedom of Information Act, he was able to secure the original FBI records pertaining to the case of his brother's disappearance. In these files, Jeffrey found a startling new lead, and he hired private investigator Paul Rigsby. Together, the two men learned that in 1944, the FBI had interviewed two railroad porters who told a curious tale. July 4th, 1944, Chicago's main train station, four days after Lawrence Harding Jr.'s disappearance. The FBI file from Washington that we were able to get a copy of indicated one of the teenage girls showed up at the train station with a baby meeting the description of Lawrence. Excuse me, ma'am. Are you going to St. Louis? Yes, I am. Well, would you mind holding my baby for a moment? I don't know. Well, I just have to run to the washroom, and there's really nowhere for me to put him down in there. Well, I've got to get that train. So you, you hurry up now. I don't want to be a standee. OK, I'll be back in just a moment. More than likely, the woman was on the platform with the baby. The train's fixing to pull off, and she's not sure if the teenage girl is on the train or not on the train. And realized that it was her time to get on the train and, and was believing the teenage girl when she had told her not to worry. And more than likely, she got on the train with the child waiting for the teenage girl to find her. However, after the train took off, it became obvious that the teenage girl didn't make the train. Track three, arriving from Chicago. When the older woman with the baby arrived at Union Station in St. Louis, she approached two porters, uh, George Hill and a Charlie McCall, and explained to them how she came by the baby. Can you help me? Yes, ma'am. I was in the Chicago train station, and this teenage girl left this child for me to hold. She said she was going to the washroom, but she never came back out. Have you seen anybody around here looking for a child? No, ma'am. What was she wearing? 
She also told him that she was going to Magnolia, Arkansas, but told him that if that mother decided she wanted the child, she'd be in Magnolia and she could find her there. I got nine children of my own. I know one more won't hurt me. Well, I'll keep an eye out for her, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. When Paul first told me about the lady taking my brother all the way to Magnolia, Arkansas, it made me really feel good. I was really kind of hoping against hope that that uh, he would that the lady had taken him to Magnolia, Arkansas, which is a very small town. Everybody knows each other, and it would be easy to locate my brother. Hi. Hi, my name is Paul Rigsby. I'm an Armed with this promising information, Rigsby immediately went to Magnolia. He conducted interviews and combed through the town's records, but unfortunately turned up no trace of the woman or her family. Check with any man. Thank you for your help. When Paul returned from Magnolia, Arkansas, and he basically came back empty-handed, it was a blow. Uh, but it wasn't one that I couldn't overcome, or that Paul and I couldn't overcome. Then Paul theorized, and, and I do believe this is true, that more than likely because it was July 4th weekend, that this lady returned from Magnolia, Arkansas, either to Chicago or maybe even to Detroit. And that may be where my brother is today. The woman at the train station probably thought that the girl didn't want this child. I believe that this woman was a good Samaritan. Uh, she took care of the child. She did everything she could uh, to let the porters know where she was going. And uh, in, in no way, shape, or form did she have anything to do with the abduction. Jeffrey Harding will not give up his search until he finds out what happened to his brother. He is certain that he is alive and probably unaware of his strange past. If there's anything that I dream about as being the happy ending, it would be finding my brother, finding out that he was raised in a loving environment, finding out that um, he would be willing to accept me and accept my family, and that we could spend our lives together as friends. Next, the story of how FBI surveillance in a quiet New Jersey suburb revealed a vast money laundering and cocaine distribution crime ring. In the summer of 1986, a cat and mouse game between the FBI and the notorious drug dealer played out in an unusual setting, an affluent suburb of Cliffside Park, New Jersey. The FBI had managed to trace a money laundering ring to its lair, and they wanted to track these illegal millions to their source, cocaine. This quiet, wealthy neighborhood would seem to be an unlikely place to find a criminal gang. But its isolation and security was exactly what the mastermind of this money laundering ring was looking for. Pedro Uribe was a 38-year-old Colombian with direct ties to the infamous Medellin cartel, and he ran his criminal organization with a ruthless hand. Pedro Uribe ran this organization by fear. Informant information tells us that one of his couriers lost 75 kilos of cocaine. Uribe, on hearing this, um, had this individual, as well as his, his family members, murdered. It later turned out that the man was innocent. This only added to Uribe's reputation for viciousness. Surveillance site four is ready. Roger, standing by. In May of 1986, the FBI decided to set up round-the-clock surveillance of several of Uribe's properties. They soon learned that in order to keep the outward appearance of normalcy, people posing as families were trucked in on weekends. Ironically, the surveillance showed that these mock families changed from week to week. In the evenings, in order to make these homes look less suspicious, each was occupied by a live-in babysitter. Uribe was also careful in selecting the style of house he occupied. One of the primary features that they looked for when renting these houses was an attached garage with an automatic garage door opener, and if it didn't have it, they'd install one. Uh, this was done so they could get in and out uh, with different individuals and less chance of being seen by the neighbors. Using these houses as a base, Uribe had developed a simple and seemingly foolproof money laundering scheme. 
Low-level operatives nicknamed Smurfs by the FBI were dispatched from the houses to banks throughout the New York metropolitan area. Can I help you? Yes, could I please have a money order for $1,980? These Smurfs would then use small amounts of the illicit cash to buy legitimate money orders from many different banks. At the height of the operation, there were seven Smurfs identified that were money laundering $50,000 a day. And during five working days, they could money launder up to $2 million a week. Though the FBI knew Uribe was a money launderer, they had yet to prove that he dealt cocaine. But one day, they got lucky. On September 3, 1986, outside of one of Uribe's safe houses, agents observed the surreptitious delivery of some mysterious boxes. Gambling that there was cocaine hidden inside those boxes, the FBI decided to try and catch Uribe red-handed. The following night, they made their move. FBI, open up! Please! Get out! 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 This is Richie. Listen, I got a female subject in the living room. Come up here. I need a search. Bam, we got 20 keys. In their search of the house, the FBI found 307 kilos of 95% pure cocaine wrapped in plastic bags. Hey, jackpot. 30 keys at least. The total amount of cocaine seized that night would have been worth $7 million on the street. FBI agents searched Uribe's other safe houses, and in one home, a specially trained dog led the FBI directly to a large potted plant. What do you got? Good dog, what's that? We got a hit. Good dog. Oh, boy. That's a hit, huh? When the plant was examined, the agents got a surprise. They found $800,000 in cash, covered with enough traces of cocaine to have attracted the dog's attention. But unfortunately, Uribe and his henchmen had been tipped off and managed to escape. And today, he and his associates are wanted men. Pedro Uribe is believed to be regularly commuting between the United States and Colombia. He was last spotted in 1989 in New Jersey at a christening ceremony for a relative. Three of Uribe's partners in crime are also Colombian nationals. They have been identified as Hugo Balbin and two brothers, Luis and Ivan Arango. The three fled to Colombia, but the FBI have reason to believe that the Arango brothers are back in the New York area. Another Uribe henchman, Miguel Villegas, is believed to be in the Los Angeles area. Recently, law enforcement officials in Utah contacted us with an urgent request. Police believe they are very close to solving one of the most appalling crimes in the state's history. They hope that someone watching tonight may be able to supply the final piece of evidence. They are offering a $20,000 reward for information leading to a conviction in this case. On August 26, 1982, three-year-old Rachel Runyon was abducted from a playground near her home in Sunset, Utah. 24 days later, Rachel's body was found, partially submerged in a small creek about 20 miles from the playground. Eyewitnesses describe Rachel's abductor as a black male in his 20s or 30s, approximately six feet tall. Two and a half years later, police discovered a gruesome message scrawled across the bathroom wall of a local all night long. It read, beware, I'm still at large. I killed the little Runyon girl. Remember, beware. The message was signed with an upside down crucifix and the number is 666. With the upside down cross and the triple six, it indicates to us that there could very well be a satanic cult involved in the kidnapping of Rachel Runyon. In recent months, investigators have uncovered even more disturbing information in Rachel's case. The new information that we have received through an informant leads us to believe that the motive behind the kidnapping of Rachel Runyon was done for making a movie of her uh, being tortured and her being sexually molested and exploited by these people that had kidnapped her and being murdered on what is commonly known as a snuff movie. In this photograph, Rachel is wearing the same dress that she had on the day she was abducted. Police speculate that she may also be wearing it in the film.
Next, the story of a cunning Casanova who has used at least 15 different aliases to bilk lonely women of their savings. Our next story profiles a particularly devious con man. Police have nicknamed him the Sweetheart Swindler. He victimizes women, vulnerable divorcees and widows in their middle years. One of his victims, a woman from Missouri whom we will call Sarah, has agreed to describe her five-day ill-fated romance with a sweetheart swindler. It all began last August with a phone call. Hello? Oh, hi. Uh, this is Jerry Gamble calling. You remember me? Uh, no. Uh, we, we met last year in a restaurant. You were two friends. Uh, this gentleman called me and he said that he had met me well, look, I've got an and idea. that he was calling to see if I would go out and have dinner car? with him. How would that be? I was divorced at this time, and I wasn't in the habit of dating. So it sounded kind of pleasant to be able to go out and have dinner at this particular time. And this is one reason why I agreed to go have brunch the next morning. I've been divorced for a long time, and I've raised my children myself, so... I worked very hard. At brunch, Sarah quickly gave up her effort to remember where she had met Jerry before and simply enjoy the conversation. Soon he had completely won her over. I didn't think you were interested at all. I'm, I'm glad we were finally able to get together. Well, I didn't know anything about you or who you were, but... I enjoyed the brunch. It was pleasant. And we decided to kind of spend the day together. Jerry told Sarah he was in the jewelry business, on the road constantly with a company car and driver. He said he had sent his driver to make a delivery in another town and was temporarily without a car. He told Sarah he was a widow and very lonely. He needed someone to share his life, traveling from one luxury hotel to another, dining at the best restaurants. He confessed to Sarah that she was just the type of woman he had been looking for. I wanted to believe him and all these bright, beautiful pictures that he painted. Life really hasn't been easy for me. Uh, you know, it was really nice to think that I maybe would be able to relax, to travel, to have all these nice things, and I wouldn't have to work. To me, this was uh, appealing, very appealing. One of the goals I made for myself before I die is to visit all 50 states. That same evening, Jerry took Sarah and her daughter Ellen out to dinner. Ellen was skeptical, but Jerry soon ingratiated himself. He impressed both women when he brought out samples of the jewelry he said he sold city to city. Look at those rings and those stones. Aren't those gorgeous? Ellen, here, just try on that little cocktail ring. Not so little, I'd say. Well, compared to some of the other stones I have, it is. May I try one? Well, on? sure. Go ahead. That's what jewelry's for. It's to be worn. Look at that. That's a real diamond. Don't break it. You can't, you can't hurt it. It's indestructible. It's a diamond. <laughs> Jerry did not make any sexual advances, but the day after he and Sarah met, he began to plan their wedding. He asked her to go with him on a road trip, which would culminate in their marriage. He was the type of a man that took control. This was something that I liked. I liked someone to kind of take over, take charge. I need to ask a favor of you. I've got some checks coming from the East Coast. Jerry told Sarah that he would soon be receiving several checks and that one would be made out to her. He wanted her to deposit it in her account so that she could pay her bills before they left. What Sarah had no way of knowing was that Jerry had stolen the check from one of his former girlfriends and made it out to Sarah himself. Late the next afternoon, Jerry rushed Sarah to the bank, telling her the check had just arrived. At the last moment, he asked her to take out cash for him. Hi. Hello, may I help you? Yes, I'd like to deposit this, and I'd like to withdraw $3,000. Ma'am, this is an out-of-state check. Yes. I'm going to have to get my supervisor's approval. Coming in at that time, East Coast banks are closed. I uh, looked at the check, saw that it was made to Sarah. Uh, she was a good customer. And she was insistent the check was good, so I went ahead and okayed the check for her. You have a good day. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. Right. Nice meeting you. Okay. Bye. We were immediately going to start traveling. We were going to Nashville, and he was going to get my engagement ring there, and then we were going to go on further east and 
When we met up with his daughter and son, then we were going to get married. He told me he was going to buy me a five-carat diamond engagement ring. That was quite a large engagement ring. That same afternoon, just four days after they had met, Jerry and Sarah were on the road to Tennessee in Sarah's car. Jerry had invited Sarah's daughter, Ellen, to go with them. Mama, we're five minutes early. Right. Don't worry about it. Okay, now this is the picture. It's exactly where he said to be. In Memphis, Jerry said he had a business meeting and asked Sarah and Ellen to meet him in the hotel lobby afterwards. How do I know? He never showed up. Okay. You're wonderful. I guess he should be coming. Come yeah, over right over there by the desk. We waited around the hotel, and after a couple of hours, I knew that he wasn't coming. And as time went along, I realized that we had been taken. I realized we were being made fools right there. I was angry. Truly, I was angry. I really didn't know what to do. Back in Missouri, Sarah found out that the check Jerry had given her was no good. She had been counted out of $3,000. Sarah finally went to the local police to file a report. They discovered that Jerry had been practicing the same scam all over the country for at least two years. Since I started my case, I believe he's a suspect in at least 22 other cases in as many as 15 different states. Unfortunately, probably only a third of the cases get reported due to the, to the victims being embarrassed. We think he locates victims primarily through newspaper articles or advertisements. We've known that on occasion he has access to only hearts clubs or mailers. You have to understand that that is all he does. He's very, very good at it. That's how he makes his living. And one shouldn't particularly be embarrassed by being pulled in by this type of scam. I meet a lot of women in my line of work, but I never know whether they're interested in me or they're just after my jewelry. Well, I'm an attorney and... I'd like to see him stopped. I'd like to see him pay for it. I mean, I know how I feel from all this. It's a very devastating feeling. Yeah, well, well, I can understand that. Well, maybe we can get together some other time then. <laughs> the sweetheart okay. swindler is still active. He has recently surfaced in Nevada, Colorado, California, and Washington State using the aliases Jerry Roberto Gamble, Robert J. Copeman, and 15 others. He left his latest victim in the lurch after she had invited 60 guests to their engagement party. Police believe he is almost certainly involved in another whirlwind romance at this very moment, and that the object of his affection should watch her checkbook very carefully. These are bank surveillance photos of the sweetheart swindler. He is between 5'5 five five and 5'8 five in height, weighs 150 to 160 pounds, and is around 48 years old. He has a New York accent and is known to own a 22 revolver. To date, he has made off with a total of $125,000, all in relatively small amounts. Update. The sweetheart swindler has been captured. On March 28, 1991, police in Kenosha, Wisconsin, arrested a man calling himself Robert Cook after he allegedly romanced a woman and then swindled her out of $10,000. At the time of Cook's arrest, police recovered a dozen false identification cards, all issued in different aliases from various states. They also found blank checks apparently stolen from previous victims. Next, the shocking story of a brutal crime spree that left four people dead in less than 24 hours. Last March, the FBI asked Unsolved Mysteries to help them unravel one of the bloodiest and cruelest crime sprees in the history of Texas and Arkansas. Perhaps the most frightening thing is that the FBI believes the killers are two teenage boys who on the surface appear innocent and harmless. 
Gainesville, Texas, a small bedroom community 30 miles north of Dallas, close to the Arkansas-Oklahoma border. 10 a.m., March 7, 1988. Just outside Gainesville, Tommy Matthews and Kenny Davis, local electricians, see two teenagers poking around their father-in-law's Lincoln Continental. When we first seen them, uh, one, the blonde suspect, was looking into the white Lincoln like he was looking for a set of keys or something. We made a U-turn and come back out the drive, and we stopped them in the driveway in front of his house. Is there a problem? Yeah, there's a problem. I just want to know what you're doing here. Uh, well, we, uh, we needed to use a phone and... Well, there's not a phone in that car. And there's not anyone home, so I think y'all need to get out of here. Uh, okay, no problem. Uh, we'll just use the phone down by the store. Okay. Sorry. They didn't act violent or look violent, you know. They just looked like two kids running around getting into mischief, you know. 10-15, the two boys walk toward the intersection of County Road 131 and Route 6. Around 11 a.m., just 200 feet away from the intersection, 23-year-old Dina Woodard and her one-year-old son, Corey, return home to their trailer. One ten p.m., Dina Woodard is found dead, brutally stabbed and nearly decapitated with an axe. Miraculously, her baby is unharmed. From the appearance of everything out there, there was a struggle inside the, uh, the residence, and uh, they killed her. And then stole her two guns and left in her 1981 T-Bird. Dina Woodard's killers head toward State Highway 82, they drive 60 miles southeast to the small rural community of Farmersville, Texas. When you have a situation start developing like this where the first victim is killed, then it's panic time. They run to get away, and then it doesn't get any better. Uh, the further down the highway they go, the, the more involved they become and the more killings that take place. Mid-afternoon. The killers approach the farmhouse of 85-year-old Cecil Morrison and his 62-year-old son, Cecil Leonard Morrison. Howdy. Uh, howdy. Uh, could I use your telephone? What, what for? Uh, my car broke down. Your car broke down? In the house! The killers stay in the house for between one and three hours, savagely torturing and beating the two old men with a weapon stolen from Dina Woodard's car. They kill both men with a 22 rifle, then leave. 5 p.m., a neighbor sees two teenagers getting into the Morrison's beige 1984 Chevrolet pickup truck. Shortly after, the boys drive off. Mysteriously, Dina Wooder's blue Thunderbird seems to have disappeared. It was not just a quick murder. It was over some period of time. Quite a battle going on in that house. Now, why they felt it necessary to beat the old men and torture them like they did, we do not know. 9 p.m., Saratoga, Arkansas. 200 miles away from the Morrison's farm, the boys drive the stolen pickup truck into the shallow water of a lake, then throw in Dina Woodard's guns. 9.45 p.m., 
An eyewitness clearly sees a teenager three different times as he drives his own truck back and forth through Saratoga. Ten p.m. The boys walk to the trailer of their fourth victim, 29-year-old Kenneth Oldham. He is inside with his girlfriend, Brenda Gibson. Oh no, I'll go check it out right quick. May I help you? Uh, yeah. My truck broke down. Do you think you could give us a hand? Yeah, come on in. Okay, thanks. Kenny didn't think they was dangerous. He thought they was really sincere, else he would have never attempted to help them. That's right. All right. And when they went out through the kitchen door, I looked out the window. And that was the last I saw of him, alive. 10.15 PM, the two teenagers drive away with Kenneth Olden and his 1983 Mustang. Unfortunately, Brenda Gibson does not get a look at the boys' faces. Sometime later, they arrive at Millwood Dam, five miles from Olden's trailer. The truck should be right over there. I think the cables are in the back. OK, I'll go ahead and get them. Hey, man. There ain't no truck around here. What's going on? Hey. The two teenagers make their getaway in Kenneth Olden's Mustang, leaving him dead. Nine a.m. the next day, 200 miles west of the spot where Kenneth Olden lies dead, Oklahoma farmer Bud Sprouse finds Olden's Mustang. He also notices two sets of footprints. They'd done a lot of walking by the side of the road there. One of them had a 11 or a 12 tennis shoe. The other one would be about a eight, eight and a half tennis shoe. In less than 24 hours, the killers had come full circle. Starting in Gainesville, Texas, going southeast to Farmersville, then northeast to Saratoga, Arkansas. Finally, they returned west to Brown Springs, Oklahoma, less than five miles from where their bloody path started. The big question is why would they have returned to within five miles of where they committed the first murder? Uh, we felt like we were dealing with something here in our own neighborhood. After the two killers completed their deadly circle by dumping Olden's Mustang on the lake, they seemed to disappear without a trace. Four months into the investigation, another important clue turned up. Cecil Morrison's grandson found an earring that the FBI believes the killers left behind in his grandfather's pickup truck. This earring depicted a skull being carried by a bat. And that was another key break in this case the finding of that earring in that truck. We later ran a photograph of that earring in the Gainesville local paper, and a young man came forward and identified that earring as belonging to him. Hey, where did you get the earring? A girl gave it to me a couple of years ago. OK. Do you still have the earring? Mm. No, sir, I don't. What's happened to it? I lent it to a friend of mine a couple of months ago. The boy, Lee Renfro, was a 16-year-old from Gainesville. He later told police he had given the earring to another boy named Caldwell, who at the time lived in a house less than 200 yards from Dina Woodard's trailer. The Caldwell family had moved out of state one month before Dina Woodard was murdered. Lee had given me a lot of earrings, and I would borrow or take some from him every once in a while, like whenever I didn't have one. But as far as that earring in particular, I have no idea. Just can't remember. On the morning of the murder spree, witnesses had seen two teenage boys who matched the description of the killers walking away from the Caldwell house. This case has got to be solved. As long as it goes unsolved, there's still that concern that we in the citizens community have that there's still some killers out there walking the streets, and who's to say when 
they might decide to strike again and go on another crime spree. Last season, we profiled a bank robber whose clumsy behavior during holdups earned him an unusual nickname. Authorities call the robber Fumbles and believe that he may be responsible for as many as 33 bank robberies throughout Florida since 1984. They estimate that Fumbles has stolen in excess of $100,000 in the past five years alone. Update, a Fumbles robber has been captured. Within minutes of our broadcast, the Clearwater, Florida Police Department received a call from one of our viewers who recognized Fumbles as Ross James Preston, a 23-year-old student living in Clearwater. On May 24, 1989, FBI agents, Clearwater police officers, and Pinellas County Sheriff's deputies arrested Preston while he was test driving a pickup truck. A search by warrant was made of the vehicle Mr. Preston was driving when he was arrested. Inside the vehicle uh, were found a ball cap with the letters CAT on the cap. Also found were a pair of gardening gloves uh, and a pair of sunglasses and a jacket. Uh, these were very similar to items which were observed being worn by the bank robber we called Fumbles. On August 2nd, Ross James Preston admitted to committing 33 armed bank robberies as part of a plea bargain was charged with only seven of the holdups. He has since been sentenced to 25 years in prison. Join me next week for another edition of Unsolved Mysteries.